Hey everyone, my name is Ned, and I would like to welcome you to 365's course on Leveraged Buyouts. I'm very excited you're here. LBO transactions are one of the most interesting topics for finance students. Throughout this journey, you will learn a great deal about the mechanics of LBO transactions, who carries them out, and what kind of debt structures they use. In addition, this is a great way to improve your financial modeling skills in a practical way. Here's our plan of action. We'll start with several theoretical lessons in which we will discuss what is an LBO? What are the mechanics of an LBO transaction? When is this type of deal a feasible option? Who are the lenders and what types of debt they provide? how sponsors generate value in an LBO, and how to determine the LBO price. In the last theoretical lecture, we'll examine the Dell case study, which has been called the deal of the century in some financial articles. Once we do that, we'll be ready to solve a paper LBO model. It is an essential part of the private equity interview process. Usually, at interviews, you're not allowed to use a calculator to solve this model, as you're asked to do some very rough approximations and assumptions. However, we'll solve our paper LBO in Excel, adding a thin layer of sophistication to it. Finally, we'll be able to build a complete LBO model from scratch. Much more sophisticated than the paper LBO, this model will allow you to complete your understanding of the mechanics behind LBO deals. As you can see, we'll gradually cover everything you need to know about LBOs step by step to ensure you make the most out of this course. In this introductory lesson, we have a pretty simple task. We want to answer the question, what is an LBO? A leveraged buyout is a type of M&A deal in which the acquirer uses a high portion of debt to finance the transaction. In other words, this is an acquisition with high debt use. Typically, LBOs are carried out by financial buyers, such as private equity or hedge funds. A bit less often, although it still happens, LBOs can be carried out by strategic bidders too. When screening for LBO targets, the goal is to find a firm that produces stable operating cash flows and has relatively low debt financing prior to the transaction. The financial buyer comes in and uses a significant amount of leverage to fund the deal. So, once the acquisition is concluded, the target becomes a highly levered entity. This allows financial buyers to invest a limited amount of equity. Lenders are willing to finance the deal because the target has a solid underlying business, which is expected to generate a stable stream of cash flows. The target's underlying business and assets are the only guarantees lenders have. Depending on the seniority of the particular loan facility, lenders will price potential risks in the interest rates they charge the target. Besides financial buyers, the investors in LBO deals are also called financial sponsors. They provide the equity capital for the deal. The bet equity investors make is that in several years, the target can repay a substantial portion of the leverage added to its balance sheet during the LBO. If everything goes well, and the target does indeed manage to repay a good portion of its debt, equity sponsors can obtain a great IRR, provided that the capital they invested initially is a small fraction of the firm's enterprise value. In the next video, we will talk about the mechanics of an LBO transaction. Hi and welcome back. In this lesson, you will learn how an LBO works in practice. We can distinguish three main steps that are typical for this process. The first one is the creation of a new company, which will be used for the purposes of the LBO deal. It is easy to imagine that the owners of the new company, or NUCO, are the equity sponsors carrying out the LBO. Then, 
In the second stage, once the new co is created, sponsors proceed to fund it with equity and debt. The leverage ratio will vary depending on current market conditions and sponsor IRR targets. But in general, we can expect that the new co will be funded with 85% debt and 15% equity, a very aggressive approach, or 50% debt and 50% equity, conservative for an LBO. Please remember that not all debt with which the new co is financed will be the same. Typically, senior loans represent around 80% of the total quantity of debt. The remaining 20% is given by high-yield subordinated debt, charging higher interest rates but requiring inferior credit guarantees compared to senior debt. I hope it's clear that to get to stage two and the use of debt funds, equity sponsors have presented the proposed transaction to lenders much earlier, even before the creation of the new co. They have managed to obtain their financing approval and all terms have been agreed on. And finally, in step three, the SPV purchases the target's shares and the target company is merged into the new co. Of course, we can expect that the target's name is well established and has commercial value. This is why the new co's name is almost always changed to that of the target. Hopefully, the mechanics of the process make sense now. But to be certain, let's provide a practical example. A private equity fund is interested in an LBO transaction with a target company called Total. Their balance sheet looks as follows. Cash, 100. Current assets, 500. Fixed assets, 900. Which makes for total assets of 1,500. On the liabilities and equity side, we have current liabilities of 500. Financial liabilities of 200 and equity of 800. So, total liabilities and equity are also equal to 1,500. The private equity fund is interested in financing the deal with 70% debt and 30% equity. 80% of the total debt is given by a senior loan, while 20% is a subordinated loan with lower guarantees. Lenders have agreed to the proposed structure and have committed the debt funds. In stage one, the private equity fund creates a new co. Then, as we said earlier, the second step consists in funding the new co with debt and equity committed by lenders and equity sponsors. Total's equity is 800. We make the rough assumption shareholders would be willing to sell at the same price. In addition, equity sponsors would like to refinance Total's existing financial liabilities. We can calculate the firm's enterprise value in the same way as usual. Equity plus debt minus cash. It is equal to 800 plus 200 minus 100, which gives us 900. This means that the new co needs to be financed with 900 of cash. 630 of this amount is obtained through debt and 270 through equity. Furthermore, we can distinguish between the senior debt of 504 and a subordinated loan of 126. Perfect. In phase three, the NUCO buys total shares and the two entities are merged in the NUCO legal entity, which is renamed total. 800 are used to buy Total's equity, and the remaining 100, together with the cash availability of Total at the time of the merger, is used to repay the existing loan. This is the balance sheet of the combined entity. As a result of the deal, Total ends up with the same amount of assets, except for cash, which was used to repay the existing loan, and much higher leverage on the liabilities and equity side. We said that, by definition, 
every LBO transaction uses a high amount of leverage. This means lenders are important stakeholders in an LBO, and we need to be familiar with their role. All transactions that involve significant amounts of debt organize this debt into several tranches. Let's give an example. Financial debt can be structured in three tranches. Term A, Term B, and Term C. Term A would be the most senior type of debt issued. It will cover 50% of the transaction price and will have a spread of 200 basis points above LIBOR. Term B is junior, compared to Term A. This means Term A lenders will be reimbursed before the ones who provided Term B. In this case, we say that Term A has an advantage in terms of access to collateral assets, and this renders Term B riskier. The spread of Term B reflects this riskiness, and it is priced at 250 basis points above LIBOR. And finally, we have Term C, which is the last layer of senior debt issued. Term A and Term B lenders will be reimbursed before Term C lenders. Hence, it is riskier than both. Unsurprisingly, it is priced at 300 basis points above LIBOR. So, these are the three tranches of debt. Lenders can choose which one corresponds to their risk-return appetite. Financial sponsors, the equity holders of the target, are interested in gearing as much debt as possible. That is why, sometimes, they use paid-in-kind mechanisms. The most common pick instrument is a mezzanine loan. As you can guess from its name, this isn't purely a debt tool. It is a mixed one. Half debt, half equity. A mezzanine loan is typically composed of two parts. A loan that must be repaid, similarly to the three tranches we discussed before, and an option, which can be converted into shares of the target upon completion of its sale. This provides some upside to the owners of a mezzanine loan. At the same time, they will be the first ones who sustain losses if things go wrong with the target, along with equity holders. So yes, a mezzanine loan is another popular instrument used in most LBOs. It is significantly riskier than the other debt tranches, but provides a great upside if everything goes as planned. LBOs are risky business, and lenders expect good IRR. Senior lenders' remuneration will come from the spread of money market rates, net of taxes. They will consider the initial debt drawdown amount, the holding period of the deal, the periodic interest rates they will receive, and the principal repayment they will get at closing. Mezzanine investors have a different risk profile. They make an initial contribution, receive periodic interest rates, a principal repayment at the closing of the deal, and an equity kicker. The equity kicker allows mezzanine investors to acquire shares of the target at a predetermined price upon closing, which ensures they participate in the upside of the deal. We should remember that a different amount of debt provided by lenders can be repaid in the years after the LBO provided the target continues to produce stable operating cash flows and is able to cover interest expenses. Almost always, lenders are able to include in their financing agreements a clause known as cash sweep, a financial covenant that states all free cash is used to repay debt. Okay, we're making excellent progress. In our next lecture, we'll talk about the concept of debt capacity and how to measure it. Thank you for watching. Equity sponsors are the architect of an LBO transaction. Their goal is to maximize IRR for a given level of risk. However, considering that the higher the leverage used for the deal, the less capacity equity sponsors need to invest, they are almost always tempted to use the maximum leverage possible.
It is up to lenders to figure out how much is the highest amount of debt they would be willing to provide for a specific LBO deal. In other words, lenders and equity sponsors must measure the debt capacity of the LBO transaction and agree on the sources of funding beforehand. Multiple factors play a role in this assessment. Current interest rates, market conditions, and the risk appetite of lenders the robustness of the target's business, and more. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of lenders. How can we determine the debt capacity of a given transaction? First, we need to perform a cash flow projection of the target firm. For that, we need to build revenue growth assumptions. This is a challenging and important exercise. Revenue development shapes the forecast of all financials because the rest of the cost and balance sheet items are modeled as a percentage of revenue. A diligent analyst can use different ways to assess revenue growth potential, such as forecasting through the bottom-up and top-down approaches. Once revenue predictions are in place, it isn't difficult to model the other cost and balance sheet items of the target and obtain cash flow projections. Lenders want to see how these figures would allow the target to service the debt they've provided. But please remember, the target needs to cover both interest and principal payments. Therefore, lenders would be interested to study how the forecasted operating cash flows would cover both interest expenses and debt repayments. The debt service cover ratio indicates precisely that. To calculate it, we divide operating cash flows by the sum of interest expenses and debt repayments. Depending on the lender's risk appetite, they would feel comfortable with a DSCR ratio that does not fall under a certain threshold throughout the entire forecast period of the LBO model. It is up to the specific lender to determine an exact DSCR value, but this relationship is what defines a transaction's debt capacity. Very often, the debt capacity in an LBO deal is expressed with the debt to EBITDA multiple. It varies from industry to industry and can range from three times debt EBITDA to even seven times debt EBITDA. However, the drawback of debt to EBITDA is that it doesn't take into consideration interest payments. So, the DSCR ratio is what lenders are more likely to consider.